Today we'll be starting with the explanation of the third sutra of Vibhudipada. The third sutra of the Vibhudipada. Did we do the third one or am I supposed to go to the fourth one? Fourth one, fourth one. Yeah. Fourth one, man. Yeah, so I'll start with the fourth one. Okay. So the fourth sutra of the Vibhudipada is about the Sanyama or Samyama. The sutra is Trayam Ekatra Samyamaha. Okay, what is Trayam? Trayam is three. Trayam means three. Three what? The three aspects that we have understood yesterday, which are Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi. Those three, the triad of Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi is coined or termed by sage patanjali as sanyama okay so the word sanyama is used for the three together dharana dhyana and samadhi all three together comprise of sanyama clear with that yes ma'am yeah so when uh, one transcends into dhyana and then followed by uh, dharana then followed by dhyana and then into the samadhi those three actually happen in a consecutive order like you see first dharana then dhyana then samadhi so these three happen in a particular order not randomly when these three are happening, we can't demarcate one from the other very uh, precisely. Like this is the end of dharana, then the beginning of dhyana, then the end of dhyana and beginning of samadhi. So one flows into the other. One limb flows into the other. When one has mastered dhyana, automatically they enter into a state of dhyana. They can't stop the practice at dhyana and then again start off the practice of dhyana. I think you're understanding. So it is like a flow. It's like a continuum, like a wave. So when dharma is perfected, automatically the person flows into a meditative state called dhyana. And when they master dhyana, they automatically enter into the state of samadhi. And yesterday I also clarified the difference between dharana, dhyana and samadhi. Dharana, I gave you the example of water. So when we see water being poured from a beaker into a, a glass or a tumbler, you see that the flow of the water is not very continuous because of the structure of the molecules, water molecules. There's a gap between the molecules. So what this indicates is that Dharana is compared with that uh, shape of the water molecules and the distance between the water, water molecules. It's not a very continuous flow when you pour water from a beaker into a tumbler or, a, or any other container. So when you observe in minute detail, you will know that there, there is a gap between the molecules. That aspect is compared with dharana, where there are periods of focus and there are there are there is some kind of moving away from the object of concentration also in dharana. And dharana is called as concentration with effort. One has to try put effort to focus on the object, object of concentration. So when there is a mastery of this uh, concentration on the object, it becomes continuous. Now that continuity is compared with the flow of a highly viscous liquid like honey or oil or any other liquid which has a high viscosity. That kind of a flow where there is very little or minimal gap between the molecules of the liquid, you see a very continuous and a smooth flow when you drop the liquid from one beaker into another beaker. That flow is so continuous. That flow is related with dhyana, is compared with the state of dhyana. So here the number of thoughts which are not related to the object 
of i can say not there or very minimal so the person is able to continuously focus on the object meditation now when the dhyana is going on i also clarified that the person is aware that meditating the person is aware of the process or the technique of meditation the person is aware of the object of meditation all these three are in the um, i can say the person is cognizant or aware of these aspects that is the uh, differentiating factor of dhyana now when it comes to samadhi the person has mastered the concentration and it becomes so effortless and when the person is able to master this he is able to let go the the sense that he is the meditator he he is meditating or uh, using a particular technique and the only thing that remains in the consciousness is the object of meditation that is the only thing that remains in samadhi all the other aspects like the meditator the process of meditation all that is um gone from the mind so the person is devoid of all that only the object of meditation remains in the mind field that is the aspect that is the unique aspect of samadhi this is what differentiates dhyana from samadhi okay i hope i made myself clear when these three things are practiced together and one attains the state of perfect concentration that is called as samyama Clear? Madam, in the samadhi, there will be a sabija, na? Yeah, yeah, there will be sabija, and uh, when sabija is mastered, then a person will be nirbija. So samyama okay. is a synonym for sabija also. So it doesn't go into nirbija. Then one has practiced samyama. they have they are still in the state of sabija samadhi okay ma'am thank you okay yeah any other questions from anybody regarding this i'm assuming there are no questions and i'm moving on to the next sutra so what is also being said is when one masters samyama they are able to kind of gain some inner illumination that inner illumination is spoken about in the fifth sutra of the buddhi pada now what accrues or what comes about when a person has mastered samyama that is given in sutra number 3.5 the sutra is जयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाजयाज
when does it happen? Agnya can only happen when the mind is very pure. Okay. Pragnya can only happen, only come about when the mind is very pure. And that purification happens when these aspects of Bahiranga are mastered, the person enters into Antaranga aspect, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. So when these aspects are mastered, the mind is said to be in a very receptive and a pure state. So that pure state gives the mind the power of this light, the shining that comes about in the mind. The, the mind is enveloped by this light and the mind is transformed into this light. That is why it is called as pragna. Okay, when one is able to get this pragna or this high degree of clarity and understanding, this is said to be the result of sayama. Okay, and this is an ongoing process. Maybe you can think of it as the uh, sabija aspect. So when the person is going through the stages of sabija samadhi, pragna is a general characteristic feature that is seen for the practitioners of sanyama. And its full manifestation occurs right before the person enters into nirbija samadhi. Okay, the full consciousness, the brightest form of occurs just before the person enters into Nirbija Samadhi. But as they are going through the stages of Sabija Samadhi, you see a gradual progress in the level of Pragna also. Okay, so don't think that it just comes as a very bright illumination at some point. No, it is also a gradual progress in the process of pragna when maybe in the lower form of the sabija samadhi the pragna is not that luminous but when they go into the higher stages of sabija samadhi maybe there's a different level of consciousness there is a different level of understanding and uh, clarity that the person gets now beyond the stages of sabija samadhi when the person is just about to enter the Nirbija Samadhi or is at the stage of Dharumega Samadhi that I was talking about yesterday, that is when the, the there is a full manifestation of Pragna. Full manifestation of Pragna. Okay. So please remember that. This is about the fifth sutra. Is that clear? That Jayat Pragna Logaha. The mastery of samyama gives pragna, which is the intuitive wisdom or inner illumination. Ma'am, yes. so can we understand that by the stage of Dharma Mega Samadhi and Nirbija, the full uh, uh, pragna happens, and in the other levels, so the gradual progress is happening. Is that how we understand, ma'am? Yes. Yes. As the levels of Sabija Samadhi are being transcended, like one moves on from the lower form of Sabija into the higher form, the level of Pragna also keeps increasing. It is like the voltage, if we keep increasing, the brightness of the bulb also increases, right? Ma'am, is this that higher knowledge that is called Bhutumar Pragna or is this one? This pragna only when it reaches the stage of uh, the end of Sabhika Samadhi and at this stage when they are entering the Nirbija Samadhi, that is called Ritambara Pragna. So at Nirbija Samadhi, it is called Ritambara Pragna. At the basic level, it is called Normal Pragna. Yeah, but this pragna so also is progressive. You see, this pragna yes. also is progressive. It is not static. It keeps increasing in its clarity and understanding as the person moves into the higher stages of samadhi okay the level see when you are in grade one versus when you are in grade 10 or 12 is your knowledge more or less more than the clear more. Obviously, it is the same thing. If you apply the same logic here, as you enter the state of Samadhi, it might not be uh, that clear and understanding might not be that great. But that is 
still called pragya because it has come through the going into into the stage of samadhi the mind is very pure we can't compare our minds with the person who is really a practitioner of all this okay that wisdom is different that pragna is different from the pragna that we have okay the, this wisdom is different so after they have mastered all these bahiranga and the, they are in the antaranga practices and have entered into a stage of sabija samadhi that is when they they can actually experience pragna and as they are transcending into the higher states of uh, sabija samadhi the level of pragna also keeps increasing just like the knowledge of a child who is progressing from one grade into the higher grade the knowledge keeps pro, uh, increasing and the way they look at the world and they understand different things is changed in the same way a person who is transcending into the higher states of sabija samadhi that pragna also keeps progressing clear is that clear yes yes ma'am yeah so uh, you see the old mind keeps getting replaced with a with a mind which is kind of devoid of the old samskaras the old samskaras get replaced with the newer ones which are more conducive for the uh, person to enter into deeper spiritual states that is the kind of wisdom that comes into this person now the sixth sutra is tasya bhumishu viniyogaha tasya bhumishu is what tasya relates to the previous uh, sutra the samyama the samyama is tasya bhumishu is the circumstances or the context in which this has to be applied that samyama when can it be applied okay when can we apply the samyama aspect that is given in this particular sutra based on the different circumstances or the context the application of samyama also differs in that in that way now how is this explained this as i told you samyama is an ongoing process it's it it is not like a static thing which comes about and it stops there it is not that samyama is an ongoing process and as you can see though there is no demarcation clear demarcation between one step and the next step there are signs that indicate whether the previous step is fully mastered or not only when the previous step is fully mastered can the person go into the next step that, that is the clear indication but this demarcation is not there like this is the end and that's the beginning no that is not there so this is uh, the samyama dharana dhyana and samadhi this is a very ongoing process now for this process to happen there might be i'll give you an example so uh, just imagine that you are practicing dharana okay dharana for 10 minutes you started practicing and you observe yourself for the month that you are practicing dharana in this month for example on most days you are able to focus okay on some days during your practice you kind of uh, get distracted okay there are some other days when there are fleeting thoughts that are coming into your mind and your mind is getting distracted and on very rare occasions we are kind of fully fully focused okay so if you track yourself on how you are able to uh, practice dharana for the entire month maybe this is how your graph will look like and a month later again when you observe yourself you might again feel those states of disturbed mind and a state of mind that you are fully focused now without the practice of dharana dhyana is not possible okay so to clear these kind of obstacles like you know you're getting distracted you know there are days when you were able to focus really well there are other days when you were not able to focus that well there you had lot of distractions you had fleeting thoughts coming into your head 
So you can improve your practice. And when you identify this, you understand that you have to clear such hurdles to maintain a deeper state of sanyama, well, of sanyama. So you see, because of the different context, the circumstances, the, the focus of the mind is changing. And in these different circumstances or contexts, one should apply different kinds of components, particularly the practice that supports sanyama. You, you know that on a certain day you have a meeting or an ankle pain and you're not able to sit really well for the practice. Okay, that pain might be because of an injury or it could be because of some other reason, like there, there is some kind of uh, um, probably. Uh, some kind of deficiency in your calcium levels or something like that. So you've identified that it is because of that pain. Okay, or your knees are not too flexible, ankles are not too flexible. You have not prepared your position or the posture for sitting till these 10 minutes. So how can you apply this by using the other techniques which have been prescribed earlier, such as Practicing certain asanas, practicing pranayama, practicing other things like uh, uh, Ishwara Pranidhana or even applying mantra, Kriya Yoga, all these aspects. So these practices, the other practices that you take up, these are called as the supportive practices which will make you stable in your Sanyama practice. There you can sit still for the dharana, which will progress into dhyana and then into samadhi. Okay, so for example, your mind is completely feeling lethargic. You have a lot of difficulty in concentrating. And you might also have some difficulty in breathing. And the, if you face these kind of issues, the, the technique that you can apply possibly is pranayama. So when you're using pranayama to augment and make your body suitable for meditation practice. So what are you doing? You're using the other practices to make yourself fit for the practice of Sanyama. it. So based on different circumstances and situations, the application of Sanyama differs. So when depending on the obstacles or the hurdles that you find, you have to practices and get over those stages to make your ground firm in the practice of Sanyama. So that is what it means. And this, this is what I've read from the commentary that I'm reading right now, the uh, Vyasa Bhashya. Is this clear? Tasya Bhumishu Vini Yogaha. OK? Yes, ma'am. Then uh, we'll go into the seventh sutra. Madam, author is saying that we, whatever pleasure, pain, whatever it may be, we, we have to be in sadhana. We should not be in the faster also, slower also. In that process, we have to do a sadhana. He is saying like that it is. Are you meaning the sixth sutra? Do you intend to speak about the Sixth Sutra? That is what I meant. Madam? Can you repeat what you said? I mean, are you talking about the Sixth Sutra? In what context are you Hi. saying that? Yeah, madam, that I am saying that uh, uh, when Sadaka will be there, na, when he is doing Sadhana, sometime hate will be there, sometime appreciation will, appreciation will be there, sometime pain will be there, sometimes happiness will be there. But the constant practice of sadhana should be there. It should be not a fast, it should not be a slow. Like he have to practice, he is saying in the line, in that manner he is saying. I mean, uh, see, the, the meaning that the sutra conveys is you have to apply the practice of sanyama for progressing in the stages of samadhi. Okay, why are we practicing sanyama to be able to progress through the stages of samadhi, right? So during this 
progress right. into a deeper state of samadhi your body your mind might not cooperate okay so okay, you man. should find other ways to handle this and use sanyama to progress in the way towards samadhi that is what it is intending okay madam okay. okay, okay. you might be getting distracted you might be very happy you might be sad all these things come as hurdles in your path now to overcome these things that is why the the commentary says that you need to use the other aspects other techniques which are prescribed earlier to make your body and mind conducive for the practice of sanyama and this practice of sanyama should be applied for progressing in the stages of samadhi why are we doing dharana dhyana samadhi the very purpose of doing dharana dhyana and samadhi which is called as sanyama is to be able to progress into the higher states of samadhi from savitarka we are going into nirvitarka then nir, uh, savichara nirvichara ananda asmita then after that we go into dharma mega after dharma mega we go into nirbija samadhi right so for progressing in these stages we need to apply the technique of sanyama okay now for sanyama you know that the internal three aspects are dharana dhyana and samadhi now when one is not able to sit through the practices and concentrate the way the practice the technique suggests for those cases in those circumstances you should know that you should make your body um fit i mean if you're not able to sit you should find the way in which you can make your body conducive for the practice do those things which will help the body and mind okay so that you can progress using the uh, sanyama given here that is what the bhashya says directly when you look at the sutra it never said that use the other techniques which have been suggested earlier but in the commentary the subtle aspect of making use of the other supportive techniques to be able to practice sanyama well for entering into the deeper states of samadhi is implied that is what i was meaning okay okay madam thank you yeah any other doubts from anybody should i move on to the next uh, sutra the seventh one okay yeah so the seventh sutra is about trayam antarangam purvebhya what is trayam antarangam Trayam means the three together. What are the three together? Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi are the antaranga, antaranga practices. Yesterday, you you remember I've explained to you about the antaranga and the bahiranga practices. Can one of you quickly tell me what are the bahiranga and antaranga practices of the Ashtanga Yoga? यम नियम आसन प्राणायाम प्रत्यारध बहिंग प्राक्टिस मैडम धारण ध्यान समाधि इंटरनल प्राक्टिस वेरी गुड कैन यू आल्सो आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन इन सम ऑफ द टेक्स्ट वन सेकंड लेट मी कंप्लीट माय क्वेश्चन व्हाट आर बहिंग प्रैक्टिसेस फॉर निर्बीज समाधि समाधि yes madam yes yeah so trayam antarangam purvebhya so what it is saying is in relation to the previous limbs what are the previous limbs yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara um, these five are the purve purvebhya the the uh, limbs which we have practiced or looked at earlier those are called as the 
bahiranga and the ones that we are looking at right now the trayam those three together dharana dhyana and samadhi these are called as antarangam the internal practices okay this is one sutra which is very straightforward this sutra relates to the ashtanga yoga when you think about ashtanga yoga all eight limbs how are the eight limbs divided the first five as bahiranga the last three as antaranga that is what this is saying there's nothing more to it okay should i move on yes ma'am should i move yeah. to the next one yes madam yes, yes. From an examination point of view, if you are clear with this, you will be able to answer any of the questions that come out in, in especially these sutras. Tadapi bahirangam nirbijasya. This is the eighth sutra. Now, what is the eighth sutra saying? It is talking about nirbija samadhi. And when we talk about nirbija samadhi, what are the bahiranga practices for nirbija samadhi? All the stages of Sabija Samadhi become Bahiranga for Nirbija Samadhi. Okay, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi, these three become Bahiranga practices for Nirbija Samadhi. Clear? Clear with this? Yes, madam. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm confused with the previous question that you asked when somebody said the Savitarka and Nirvitarka are external practices. And here now this one. Little confusion in the question that you asked, ma'am. Can you repeat what I asked? Ah, yeah, the previous question didn't register in my head, ma'am. So, for that, Yes, Shavani, can you please repeat? I am asking about that Nirbija Samadhi. According to Nirbija Samadhi, what is Bahiranga? I answered that Sabitaka and all right. She is asking that question explanation. Madam, asking about that. My question was according to Nirbija Samadhi, what are the practices which which are considered to be Bahiranga practices for Nirvija Samadhi. No, up to Pratyahara. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara. Uh, so, ma'am, for mm -hmm. this, how will the question be asked? Uh, like when these three become the Bahiranga, how will the question appear? When Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi become Bahiranga, it is for Nirvija, Nirvija Samadhi. In the state of Nirvija Samadhi, the, the triad of uh, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi become bahiranga. These three become external limbs for nirbija samadhi. Yesterday, and when, for there Sabija, the when I was thinking and this, for Sabija, they are antaranga, ma'am. I'm literally going to there's nothing to get confused. I mean, when you look at the Ashtanga Yoga, all eight limbs, straightforward, like Samadhi is not split into Sabija and Nirbija. It's only Samadhi. Okay. In that case, we're talking about the Ashtanga, eight limbs. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. When we talk about these eight limbs, then the first five are called as Bahiranga. The last three are called as Antaranga. Okay, now, Tadapi Bahiranga Nirbijasya, for this sutra, what it is saying is, for the Nirbija Samadhi, when Samadhi is split into Sabija and Nirbija, for the Nirbija Samadhi, Dharana, Dhyana and uh, the Sabija Samadhi aspects, all the Sabija stages become Bahiranga practices. You got it now. Clear? Yeah, got it, got it now. Karthik ji, did you understand this? What you were saying did not sound right to me because you were still saying that dharana, dhyana and samadhi are antaranga practices. 
it is not the antaranga practices when we consider nirbija samadhi when we consider nirbija samadhi all dharana dhyana and sabija samadhi all the stages of sabija samadhi become bahiranga practices okay madam okay thank you only nirbija samadhi is antaranga okay madam yeah so this is about the eighth sutra now what is with the ninth sutra 3.9 is when uh, uh, the nirodha parinama comes about now uh, previous eighth sutra spoke about the uh, nirbija samadhi being the antaranga and all other sabija samadhis dharana and dhyana all are bahiranga practices when one masters the uh, sabija aspects what comes about is the nirodha parinama the first aspect that we see as a result of the practice of the triad dharana dhyana and samadhi samadhi when i'm talking about uh, sanyama as the practice of dharana dhyana and samadhi the samadhi relates to sabija samadhi okay please remember that unless and until i explicitly call it as nirbija the the sanyama aspect talks about the sabija samadhi okay all of you clear with this can you repeat again please sorry see what i was saying is that unless and until i explicitly mention that it is the nirbija samadhi that i'm talking about you should always take the three what the dharana dhyana and samadhi the samadhi in that triad relates to the sabija samadhi okay sabija samadhi the sanyama comprises of sabija samadhi not the nirbija samadhi when uh, the sabija samadhi which is included in sanyama has been mastered that is when the, the person goes into nirbija samadhi not until they have mastered sanyama so whenever i call sai whenever i use the word sanyama i am always referring to the dharana dhyana and sabija samadhi getting it Yes. Anybody who is not clear, please uh, ask. You all clear yeah. with this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Hmm. so this aspect has to be very clear now. The first thing that comes about as a result of sanyama is the nirodha parinama. What is nirodha parinama? The the sutra says vyutthana nirodha samskara. So here the samskaras are two kinds. We know that vyutthana samskaras. Vyutthana samskaras are the samskaras which do not lead to samadhi. Right? We have understood that in the previous classes. Yes or no? Vyutthana, the ones which do not lead to samadhi. They are very distracting and disturb the mind. Vyutthana samsas make the mind the, fall into the kshipta mood and vikshipta vasthas. Remember? Yes. yes you are advising the previous classes. I don't see anybody responding well. Vyutthana samskaras, we have studied that for a good time, right? When I was talking about the initial uh, samadhi pada, I spoke about Vyutthana samskaras and Nirodha samskaras, right? Vyutthana samskaras, I clearly explained that, are the ones which are pulling the person away from samadhi aspects. They are the samskaras which will throw the person into the birth and death cycle. Right? Uh, the, the ones which are not conducive and negative for the growth of the person into the samadhi states are called as vyutthana samskaras. So in the sutra, vyutthana nirodha, he is using both the words vyutthana and nirodha. Both are contradictory. Okay, Vyutthana Nirodha Samskara. 
so the impressions which relate to the uh, agitated to the disturbed samskaras and this uh, and the uh, samskara which relates to the nirodha or the cessation or confining the mind to that particular object stopping it there those samskaras so these kind of samskaras abhibhava abhibhava is the abhibhava pradubhava means decline or the reduction so you see that there is a decline in the vyuthana samskaras and an increase in the nirodha samskaras as a result of the practice of sanyama okay he has used the word vyuthana and nirodha samskaras because he is trying to use abhibhava pradurbhava in the sense that the vyuthana samskaras are reduced and the nirodha samskaras are increased okay so when the nirodha samskaras keep happening the nirodha kshana the moment when the person experiences the nirodha samskara okay that is called nirodha kshana chittan vaya when that nirodha experience is there in the mind that kshana that kshana is supposed to be pondered upon is supposed to be uh, carefully observed so that that becomes an impression in the mind and that particular nirodha samskara that is uh, that is imprinted samskaras we know that every samskara is an imprint in the mind it creates an impression in the mind now when this nirodha samskara is in place the person is experiencing the nirodha samskara when that experience is kind of imprinted in the mind in the form of sanskara that sanskara will lead into transformation that transformation is called as nirodha parinama okay i'll explain it one more time don't worry this is not very difficult to understand at the same time it's not very easy also one thing that you need to have is there are two kinds of samskaras okay let me use a jam file so that i can help you with a simpler diagram kind of a thing my screen is still sharing please confirm the plain plain blank container okay so now we have two kinds of samskara so what are the two kinds of samskaras keep answering keep your mic on mute vithana vithana nirodha nirodha mari vithana nirodha yeah i want full participation please because i want you all to get this concept suppression of all the thoughts that caused by disturbance vithana am i right vithana Uh, now i said vyuthana are the samskaras which do not lead to which do not lead to you need to answer vyuthana samskaras are those samskaras Push. which don't lead to samadhi samadhi they are bad samskaras getting it vyuthana are the samskaras which are pulling the person down nirodha samskaras are the ones which are pulling the person into the samadhi aspect nirodha parinama with it okay madam getting it so vyuthana yes, are the samskaras which are not good for the growth of the spiritual aspect okay they are pulling the person away they are making the person disturbed so one should always remember that vyuthana samskaras have to be avoided vyuthana samskaras have to be decreased vyuthana samskaras have to be eliminated from the mind 
Now, this ha does this happen automatically? No. All the tools that are given to us are for helping us get rid of these and to promote Nirodha Samskaras. We don't want the mind to be agitated. We don't want the mind to be frustrated, distracted, disturbed. Right? So I use red for this. So this has to be reduced. This has to be cut off. And what do we want? We want the Nirodha Samskara. We want Samskaras which are good for Samadhi. Okay, Madam. Vruti Nirodha, he is saying, I think so. So, the, the Vrittis which are good for the Samadhi, usually the Ekagra Avastha and the Niruddha Avastha, those are the ones which are the stable bhumis, right? And yes, in, the, in that stable state of mind, the samskaras which arise are generally leading to nirodha. Okay, Nir nirodha or it is leading the person into a, a conducive state for samadhi. Getting it, remember these words very well. Vyuthana okay. are the bad samskaras which pull the person down and pull them away from samadhi. Nirodha samskaras are the samskaras or mental impressions which are very good for the progress into samadhi. So this sutra that we are talking about says that Vyuthana nirodha samskara. So Vyuthana nirodha samskara Abhibhava Pradur Bhavau. So decline and the rise of these samskaras, of what decline of the Vyuthana samskara, rise of the Nirodha samskara. Okay, when is this happening? When one has mastered Sayama. You're getting it? Why do we call it as Parinama? What is the meaning of the word Parinama? Change. 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 Or the transformation that we see, right? What is the transformation that we are seeing in the samskaras? What are samskaras? First, tell me that. Impressions. Yeah. Whatever the deep-rooted impressions in the mind, they are all called samskaras. These samskaras are the causes. For what? For the effect. Good or bad? It could be anything. Samskara. The causes are also good or bad. So when we, these impressions which are deep-seated or deeply rooted in the, in the trenches of the mind, they are so ingrained, so deeply rooted that they, with the uh, propensity or the power of the vasana, they come into effect. Okay, they, they, they take a form, they manifest and they become something else. So we should be very careful of what kind of samskaras we are creating for our own self. Those impressions are created based on our karmas. The karma and the samskara are like a cycle. Okay, the karma feeds. Okay, it feeds the samskara. Whatever we do leaves an impression on the mind. Yes or no? Whatever karma <laughs> does it leave an impression on the mind? Madam, your voice is breaking. It is breaking for me only for everyone. I don't know. Uh, that there was an echo carpet. Now it is not there. Okay. So this karma, the actions that we do, it could be physical, mental, verbal, any kind of action, manasa, vacha, karmana, any kind of action, mental, physical, verbal, any kind of action that is like a feed for the samskara. If we involve in that, it creates an impression. And what happens when the mind gets into that impression, that impression gets stored as a memory. When it is stored as a memory in the mind, what happens? The samskara again creates, that samskara again creates 
karma. Okay, why the samskara creates the karma? It 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 actually has a potential. You think samskara to be the potential energy. Okay, that samskara which is deeply rooted impression in the mind that drives the person to act. Right? That impression in the mind that is deeply rooted because of the impressions, the, the memory that has uh, that has been created because of the past actions, those impressions will drive the person to perform another action. Do you agree with what I said? I need a response, please. Yes, 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 ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So you see how this is becoming a very vicious and a dangerous cycle. Think we are give we are you creating all negative negative samskaras. What happens when we create negative samskaras? It leads to negative actions, right? What do the negative actions do? Because of the impressions that they create in the mind, they again create some kind of bad karma. So the karma feeds into the samskaras, and the samskaras create new karma. There's no end to it. You're getting it. So to break this whole cycle of samskara and karma, what they say is you have to practice vairagya and abhyasa. That is in the very first samadhi pada we have seen in the twelfth or the thirteenth sutra that abhyasa vairagya abhyam tannirodha. We know that abhyasa and vairagya are the two techniques or the methods to curb the wandering tendencies of the mind, the negative tendencies of the mind. Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Yes. You all are uh, not looking at the previous classes. Are you revising? If you don't revise, if you forget the previous concept, there's no point of going further with the new topics. Hmm. Okay. So these samskaras, which are negative, the vyuthana samskaras are called as the negative samskaras. Those samskaras have to decline. Those samskaras have to be eliminated. How are they eliminated? They are eliminated by the proper practice of the sanyama. The first result of sanyama is the nirodha parinama. So what happens in nirodha avastha? One creates a state of mind where the mind is only concentrating on the object of meditation. It is not wandering. Okay. And what is that? It is only for a, for a moment. It is not continuous. It is only for a particular time that the mind is able to concentrate on the object of meditation. When the mind is able to concentrate on that object of meditation for some time, you capture that moment like a photograph. Create that as an impression in your mind and use that as the samskara. That becomes your nirodha samskara. Getting it? So for the people who practice pranayama regularly, they will understand this very clearly. There comes a point after the practice of pranayama where your mind becomes very, very calm. There are no thoughts in the head. Okay, you are only able to concentrate on your breath and there's nothing else to it. And the other thoughts, where are they? They're fallen, right? This doesn't happen for a prolonged period of time. This happens based on the intensity of practice. If the practitioner is very adept in his practice, then he can stay in prolonged periods and that leads to another state. But for a, for a person who has begun the practice and is able to stay in the state for some moments. So what this particular sutra is suggesting is that nirodha kshana, when the mind is in that nirodha vastha, it is devoid of all the distractions and is only focusing on one particular aspect. Take the breath as the aspect. So it is only concentrating on the breath. So that is called as nirodha kshana. In that moment, what are you supposed to do? Chitta anvaya. So you have to unite or merge your mind 
with what with that state with that nirodha pari with that nirodha avastha of the mind getting it so what are you trying to do you are trying to make use of that that pristine time that is in your head your head space is clear of everything and it is only peacefully concentrating on the object of meditation which is breath okay e that that particular moment if you just store it in your memory the experience is so beautiful like your mind is very still you are able to feel so light you are able to feel so energetic you are able to feel so alert your mind doesn't get any other thoughts in it it is just with the breath so what it is saying is if you are able to capture that moment and store it in memory as an impression as a samskara that is called as nirodha parinama getting it getting it that's also one shana and not even more he is saying just one shana yeah was that clear i mean um, the concept was that clear yes ma'am Yes, any doubt ma'am what is chitta anvaya chitta anvaya means merging or uniting the mind with that kshana with that nirodha kshana there's one moment of that pleasantness right okay ma'am okay so when we are pulling the mind towards that kshana and merging it with that kshana that is called chitta anvaya so this state is called as this the result is called as this transformation or the change that you see is called as nirodha parinama this is the first result of of what samya samya and goodness <laughs> okay okay so clear with this i'm going to the next sutra okay so here please remember in 3.9 it said that the vyuthana samskaras are falling and the nirodha samskaras on our are on a rise and there's a moment in the uh, in the mind field where your mind goes into that nirodha kshana and the chitta has to be merged with that nirodha kshana when the chitta is merged with that nirodha kshana it creates nirodha parinama It creates a transformative state of mind, which only is dwelling in that object. Clear? So you see how the mind is pushed into changes. Unlike the superficial behavioral changes that we see in modern psychology, you see how the yogic psychology or the philosophy of yoga is helping in. changing the deeply rooted tendencies of the mind yes ma'am hmm yes ma'am yeah so it's not important now i'm going into the 10th sutra should i is if this is clear i'll go into the 10th sutra yes ma'am okay so the 10th sutra where is the ppt one second can one of you just uh, summarize this particular sutra because i want to listen what you have understood anybody who would like to talk about this okay ma'am i will try yes i'll try uh, so yes. vithana niradha saskara uh, means this ninth sutra is saying about when a person mastery over the samyama then he is able to attain that uh, nirodha saskara means vithana saskara here uh, decline and nirodha saskara is increase vyuthana sanskara means bad sanskara it does not lead to the samadhi and it makes the person pull down from the samadhi so nirodha sanskar is the good sanskara and it leads to the samadhi uh, and nirodha sanskar is very conducive for the samadhi so uh, nirodha sanskara is attained only when the mastery over the samyama 
so the first result of samyama is that is nirodha sanskara in that state mind is constantly focused on one point it means so in the mind is nirodha sanskara at that time mind is very still and just uh, we can take an object breath so chitta here chitta has more in that moment means that moment uh, means uh, nirodha khana so uh, that changes or that transfer transformation is called nirodha parinam yeah so mm -hmm. thank you lipalika that was a uh, uh -huh. good explanation i mean uh, you, you need man. to be clear that's the intent okay now we'll go into the 10th yes, sutra um the 10th sutra is a continuation of the nirodha parinama so what do we see as a continuation of the nirodha parinama in nirodha parinama i think this is one point that you need a little more clarity on lipalika we don't have a complete a prolonged span of nirodha it is only for a kshana that the person is experiencing nirodha initially we can't see practically also when we start practicing dharana or dhyana can we continuously sit in dhyana for uh, 20 30 minutes or one hour no it is not no, possible no. it is not practical we immediately get distracted right but in those distractions also when we are applying the right method we are concentrating on the right object at the right place we are able to experience some moments of that uh, that's that stillness right so those moments of stillness were called as nirodakshana now we are trying to in the next sutra sij patanjali is saying that when that kshana becomes prolonged when that kshana becomes prolonged in relation with time then it creates a prashanta vahita a very peaceful flow of that nirodha samskara we have seen that the nirodhak samskara was just for a moment in the previous sutra now in this sutra what happens when it deepens the samyama aspect even deepens further when it goes deeper the practice it becomes like a peaceful flow there is a continuity it doesn't break quite often you getting it tasya prashanta vahita samskara so tasya is in reference to the previous nirodha samskara prashanta is the peaceful flow vahita is flow prashanta is peaceful so the peaceful flow of that previous samskara is called as tasya prashanta vahita samskara so how do we understand this we should understand this as a continuation of that nirodha into a prolonged duration that is what the sutra is trying to say nothing more to it okay now how do you understand this with an example is that uh, so let's take the breath only as an example the breath when you are able to experience that calmness that pleasantness for a moment you are registering that as an impression in your mind field in your memory okay and you are coming back to the practice time and again like you are you you are doing the three times practice and you are doing it for 80 rounds throughout the day you are doing it for four times and for each time you are doing it for 20 times and and every time you are doing the practice you are able to store that impression or uh, the the subtle samskara as a memory in your head think what is happening to the mind so you are you are training your mind to get into that state many many times yes or no you are training your yes. mind to get into that state many many times so when you train your mind to get into that state many many times that flow that nirodha flow becomes continuous it is so peaceful and continuous that it happens getting it so you experience that peaceful state of flow 
okay you are not disturbed with other things which are anything other than the object of concentration apart from breath there is nothing else in the mind earlier it was only for a few seconds now it probably is for minutes or even an hour or even more that is what it says this is the truth or result of the nirodha parinama this is the order in which it is progressing you see first we saw it was it was only for a second now we are seeing that it is for a prolonged period and we are seeing it as a continuous peaceful flow what that samskara that nirodha samskara is present for a continuous period for a long time clear with this yes ma'am yes madam ji should we go into this or stop here means in Maybe this loka huh go ahead this loka he want yes to please say that by its continuous practice of the samadhi vritti becomes steady and it flows calmly by the practice of what by the practice of nir that nirodha avastha that uh, samadhi uh, samskara no no the practice of samskar the nirodha samskara what is the nirodha samskara saying nirodha samskara is saying that when you are able to concentrate on the object of meditation for a continuous period without allowing the mind to wander on any other thing that period is called as nirodha period nirodha. when this nirodha period is prolonged and it is becoming a peaceful flow for a prolonged time that is the result of nirodha nirodha parinama okay yeah rajeshwar madam wants to say something yes yes yeah, rajeshwar just saying ma'am that we chanted till here if we could finish there will be no confusion for tomorrow yeah. if it is a detailed yeah. expression we will go tomorrow yeah so we'll, we'll stop after the 11th sutra so the 11th sutra says sarvartha ekagratayo sarvartha ekagratayo so all these cognitions sarvartha means uh, all the cognitions that are happening cognition is what vritti okay everything that the mind is able to cognize all these cognitions ekagratayo ekagrata is the focus is the one pointed focus okay kshayo udayo kshayo means what kshayo means the disappearance udaya means the appearance or we can say kshayo is the rise udayo is the uh, kshayo is the fall udayo is the rise okay chittasya that which relates to the mind of the mind samadhi parinama the transformation that is uh, that is kind of marked by a completely still mind okay samadhi parinama is the transformation in the mind that is marked by a completely still mind there's nothing in the mind w what is the characteristic of it the stillness that is samadhi parinama now what is happening here is There, there is an elimination of all the other cognitions. What are all the other cognitions? Cognitions or thoughts related to other things. Everything else is eliminated, and there is a rise of the one pointedness, ekagrata. And that rise of the one pointedness is leading to a transformation. What is the transformation? The transformation is marked by a characteristic called stillness. okay the mind is completely still that is the uh, that is the indicator of samadhi parinama how how does it come into the stillness by the disappearance of all the other cognitions and the appearance of the one pointedness one pointedness on what on the object of concentration this is called samadhi parinama so what it is indirectly again pointing to is the supportive practices of abhyasa and vairagya how abhyasa and vairagya drive the mind to confine itself to a single object vairagya will pull the person away from the distracting thoughts abhyasa will help the person develop the nirodha samskaras 
you see how they are mutually supportive in bringing the state of this this samadhi parinama abhyasa will both are needed both are very much needed why nirodha uh, the vairagya will actually help in removing or eliminating the vipana samskaras of the mind and abhyasa will help in increasing the nirodha samskaras of the mind okay we are going on practicing pranayama for keeping the mind still okay and we are practicing the vairagya the dispassion dispassion of what dispassion towards the objects uh, towards the other things which are not objects of meditation we don't want to get into all those things so we are creating a dispassion towards the distractions and we are creating a, a, a one pointed abhyasa or a practice to get into the nirodha samskaras that is what we are doing we are using both in a uh, mutual supportive supportiveness i can say for bringing about the samadhi parinama so just to summarize this once again here in this particular sutra all the uh, cognitions which are not leading to samadhi are removed the, the other distracting thoughts are all removed and there is a rise of one pointedness ekagrata that is what is rising so sarvartha arkshayo what is that sarvartha all the other cognitions are falling kshayo is fall ekagrata udayo so ekagrata is on the rise it is increasing i repeated once again sarvartha is all the other cognitions or the thoughts in the mind are decreasing the word decreasing or fall is kshayo okay and ekagrata yo ekagrata yo is a, the ekagrata the the thoughts which are the the object of concentration that is called as ekagrata that state is rising the word for rising is udayo so sarvartha ekagrata kshayo udayo chittasya means all this is happening in the mind which relates to the mind leads to samadhi parinama okay this leads to samadhi parinama elimination of all other cognitions and the increase of one pointedness which is marked as a stillness in the mind that is called as samadhi parinama nothing more to it okay so can we say this uh, nirodha parinama and samadhi parinama are the same no no samadhi parinama is a um, is a higher state is a even higher state okay Th these are higher states as we are seeing nirodha parinama then ekagrata parinama then samadhi parinama so first we saw nirodha parinama now we are seeing samadhi parinama then we will see ekagrata parinama okay so as we are progressing the 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 state of mind is transforming you understanding it's becoming even more focused the focus level is increasing getting it it is not the same yes, we can't say it's the same it is going on increasing in nirodha parinama it, it was at a i can say percentage wise it was at 60% when we enter into samadhi parinama it is 80% when we enter into ekagrata parinama it is 100% okay that is how the uh, focus is increasing clear yes ma'am yeah so any questions from anybody if there are no questions can one of you quickly summarize the sutra and we'll wrap up the class for today the last sutra ma'am hmm. okay i will try 
So yeah. the sutra eleven uh, basically speaking about the samadhi samadhi parinama. So mm-hmm. sarvartha taika gratayo. So he's saying that when we are constantly able to do stay in the uh, nirodha state, what happens is all the cognitions sarvartha or the all the other cognitions. Which you can also categorize as Yudhana, will start falling or Kshaya, and uh, there will be a rise in Ekagrata or Udayo. And uh, uh, one second, uh, this stage is also marked by absolute stillness in the mind. This is Samadhi Parinama. Yes. Yes. Right. So, should we end the class? Yes, ma'am. You need to remember th- that aspect is not given in, in this four chapters of freedom about the mutually supportive practices of Abhyasa and Vairagya, how Vairagya helps in uh, removing the Vyutthana samskaras and how Abhyasa helps in bringing about the Nirodha samskaras. Okay. Take the pranayama practice as an example, the breath as the object of meditation. Okay, please uh, write about that also in your notes. These mutually supportive practices of Abhyasa and Vairagya, Vairagya for uh, the eliminating the Vyutthana samskaras and Abhyasa for bringing about the Nirodha samskaras. These are yeah, both they, very useful and they both must be practiced together. Like getting rid of the negative samskaras and also filling the mind with the, the uh, nirodha samskaras. Both has to happen simultaneously. Because the mind can't be left empty or idle, right? Can you imagine the mind without having anything? Once you don't fill it up with uh, the Nirodha samskaras, your mind automatically will tend towards the Vithana samskaras only. Yes or no? That's the natural tendency or tilt of the mind. So when you are trying to curb or eliminate the uh, Vithana samskaras by practicing Vairagya, you need to also practice bringing about the Nirodha samskaras, do abhyasa of concentrating on the object of meditation. I gave you the example of concentrating on the prana or the breath. All right, so we'll stop it here. Madam, one question, madam. In asana yes. concept is there, right? in Vasa Bhasha, how many asana names they have given? There, there are a lot of names. I think 16 or 18 names they have given. In Vasa Bhasha, names, right? yes. A- yes. Accurate how much, madam? Uh, one, I think so once they have asked in the net question. Uh, how many asanas? Huh? Yeah, madam. I think 16 or 18. Yes, yes, Vyasa Bhasha gave some names of asanas, but you might not have heard the names of those asanas ever in your life. <laughs> some asanas are uh, known to us. Uh, Siddhasana and certain other asanas are known to us, but there are other asanas which are given in Vyasa Bhasha that we haven't even heard any time. Okay. I, I will check but how, those. A, a, accurate how much, madam? 16 or 18? I will. I'll have to check. It is not on the top of my head right now. I'll check. Okay, madam. Okay, okay. Thank you. If you know, you can also bring that. Okay, okay madam, you can I'll also check it. and bring that information. Share it with the others. I'll also try to look it up and share it. Ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was I am having network issue. That's why I'm thought of getting confused. Did you say that Nirod Sanskara lead us to Vairagya, right? No, no, Nirodha Samskaras don't lead. Nirodha Samskaras are brought about by practicing Abhyasa. Vyutthana Samskaras are eliminated or curbed by Vairagya, by the by applying Vairagya. How do you apply Abhyasa and Vairagya is 
abhyasa must be applied for increasing the nirodha samskaras and vairagya has to be applied for decreasing the vidhana samskaras clear ma'am could you please repeat again see abhyasa has to be applied as a these are the two methods right yeah what are the two methods for uh, transforming the mind the two methods are abhyasa and vairagya now how do we apply abhyasa we apply abhyasa for the increase of nirodha samskaras and we apply vairagya for the decrease or decline or elimination of yuthana samskaras okay yeah any other questions no ma'am Okay. So we'll end the class and stop the recording now. Huh?